What's up everybody? I hope you're doing well. So as I've moved my practice to a new city, one thing I've been focusing on is getting to know local therapists particularly therapists that I feel like I would jive really well with. In the midst of meeting several different therapists, more than 10 over the last few weeks, there's been a theme that's popped up that I've heard time and again from the folks that I've met with. Folks don't wanna do their private practice the way everyone else seems to be doing it. And quite frankly, I hadn't realized until moving that I don't do private practice the way most therapists do it, like hardly at all. I know I talked about this in a recent video where I kinda of realized it's possible that with private practice skills, I've kind of created this like bubble echo chamber of therapists who have at least some shared values of how they want to do their private practice and therefore I kind of didn't recognize that the way I do my practice is really different than how most people do it. So all of these moments in combination culminated into the inspiration for this video because today we're going to talk about the fact that you do not have to do private practice the way that most people seem to be doing it or really it doesn't have to look like anyone else's practice if you don't want so if you're interested in hearing about some myths people represent as far as what private practice is supposed to look like as well as some ways you can approach it differently then stay tuned and if we haven't met yet welcome to private practice skills i'm dr marie fang psychologist in private practice I like to share the tools I learned the hard way about starting and growing private practice so that you don't have to. And one thing I definitely have learned the hard way is that uh, you don't have to do private practice like everyone else because I sure tried to do private practice the way that everyone else seemed to be doing it at the beginning. And honestly, that system just wasn't working for me. So I'll frame this video as a list of myths that are circulated about how you're supposed to run your private practice. But I'd like to preface this list by saying that I don't believe that the items in this list are inherently bad, not at all, but rather there are many possibilities for how you can run your practice and the items represented in this list are just one option, one way of doing it, and there are other ways you can do it as well. This list of myths about private practice is so long that I'm gonna go through them kind of quick fire style. So let's hop straight into some myths that I hear people claim about private practice often. Myth number one, I have to be on insurance panels if I want a full practice. Uh, <laughs> the answer is that's not true. Myth number two, I have to see at least 30 clients a week in order to tell people that I'm working full time. If you want to see 30 clients a week, you can, but generally speaking, most people consider like 20 clients a week to be a full-time caseload. And honestly, depending on your preferences, your personality, etc., full-time could be 15 or 12 or 10. And you know what? You can be part-time like me and see five or eight clients a week. It's up to you. Myth number three, I can't charge more than fill in the blank dollars cash rate if I'm not on insurance panels. That's not true. Whatever you filled in the blank, you can probably charge whatever you want as long as you market it properly. Myth number four, I have to offer a sliding scale in order to fill my practice. One, not only is that not true, but if you're using a sliding scale as a marketing strategy, then that's probably not the best usage of a sliding scale versus leveraging it as a tool to allow some people to access counseling services who otherwise might not be able to afford your full fee. Just think about it. Myth number five, the only way to increase my income is to see more counseling clients. That's not true for more than one reason. You can increase your income by raising your rate. You can increase your income by doing things like group counseling or having something that you sell on the side like I do, like private practice skills. There's a lot of ways to increase your income without seeing more therapy clients. If you wanna see more therapy clients because you wanna see more therapy clients, then go for it. Myth number six, in order for my practice to be considered successful, I need to continuously scale bigger. This is not true. Your practice is successful whenever it's what you consider to be successful for you and not by somebody else's metric. So if you'd set out to start a solo part-time private practice seeing three clients a week and now you are running your own solo practice seeing three clients a week, then your practice is successful. Myth number seven, I have to be willing to work with all kinds of presenting issues in order to be considered a good therapist. I don't even understand this one fully, but I've heard it many times now. And I guess the idea is that like, you're skilled in doing a lot of different things and that maybe makes you a good therapist or you're willing to take on certain types of clients that maybe not everyone is wanting to work with. And so it makes you a good person. I don't totally understand it, but focusing on one thing and doing it really well also makes you a good therapist as well. Myth number eight, 
I need to have special certifications in order to have a successful cash pay practice. I'm not sure why people think this, that somehow you have to get extra certifications in order to be able to charge a cash rate instead of have insurance pay clients, but it's just not true. As long as you're qualified to provide therapy and have your own practice and to treat the conditions that you, you know, focus on treating, then you can have a cash pay practice. Myth number nine, I have to be seasoned in my career in order to start a private practice. This is not true for many reasons, but most simply, by the time we're licensed, we have so much training that we are equipped for private practice. If there's any presenting issues that we're not equipped to see, then that's something that either we shouldn't see whether we're in private practice or not, or we need to make sure we're getting the adequate training, supervision, etc., in order to make sure we're equipped to see that presenting issue. Again, whether it's private practice or an agency or somewhere else. Myth number 10, if I advertise the presenting issues that I really wanna work with, nobody's really gonna to wanna to see me. Now, I think this myth is rooted a bit more in that kind of insecurity, self-doubt, imposter syndrome, that the thing that we really, really wanna do, either there's no demand for it, somebody else out there is better at it than we are, or you know, our ideal client will see us or our profile and walk away because they don't like us for whatever reason. But this is not true. If you can identify what you really wanna work with, by all means, go for it, and there will be people out there who need your help. Myth number 11, if I have a cash pay practice, it means that I don't really care about the people that I'm seeing. Now, I think I can kind of wrap my head around why people think this way, because if you're charging sort of a premium, a cash rate for your services, then maybe it feels more like a business transaction than a genuine helping relationship. But I would argue, at least for me, that by charging a certain cash rate, it allows me to earn the income that I want while seeing a relatively reasonable amount of clients. And so therefore I have a much larger pool of energy to draw from for each of those individual folks that I work with. I'm much more intrinsically motivated to help them rather than feeling like ah, I gotta get through this because I need to see way more clients than I really wish to in order to earn the income that I want. And along the same lines, myth number 12 is, I can't have a private pay practice while advocating for equitable care. Now, the idea here is not everyone can afford a cash rate for therapy. I mean, honestly, not everyone can afford the copay for their insurance for therapy, let alone a cash rate. So not everyone is gonna be able to afford your services who's in need of help. But just because you're charging a cash rate for your therapy services doesn't mean that there aren't other ways that you can give back. There are an array of ways that you can give back, and I actually have a whole video going over that, so I'm not gonna list it all out here, but suffice it to say, in my opinion, by charging a cash rate in my practice, it frees up more time in my schedule to give away my time in other arenas where I'm able to help people who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford my cash rate. And myth number 13, because I don't like working with specific presenting issue, fill in the blank here, it means I'm not cut out for private practice. I've heard people insert all kinds of presenting issues into that blank saying, oh, in order to have a successful private practice, I need to be willing to work with couples. I need to be willing to work with kids. I need to be working with folks with a specific diagnosis. And that's just not true. I'm not sure where this idea comes from. Maybe there's some perception that the demand for a private practice therapist is only from like a certain group of people or something, but whoever you work with, there's space for you in private practice. Hopefully it's come across by now, but whoever you are, whatever your interests and passions are, whomever it is that you wanna work with, however many hours a week you wanna work and whatever income you wanna earn, you can have your own private practice if you want to and it is possible to earn the income that you want while also advocating for equitable access for everybody. Now, I already know what's gonna happen for some folks watching this video. You heard me rattle off this list of myths and you thought, yeah, 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 but Marie doesn't understand that this specific item on that list is true for me because of whatever specific factors about your unique circumstances. Here's the thing, even if one of the items on this list creates a unique challenge for you, I still think it's possible to overcome that myth with either a mindset shift, a marketing strategy shift, or maybe some creative out of the box thinking in some circumstances. Now, if you're finding that you're stuck on one or more of these myths and it feels like there's no clear way out, then I suggest you get in touch with fellow therapists, either therapists in your area or therapists who are kind of living the type of practice life that you're hoping to live out and 
get their feedback, befriend them, see if you can glean anything from their wisdom so that, you know, they can help you catch where you might be stuck in some of those myths and how to get out of them. And regardless of how you're running your practice, if you're happy with what it looks like right now, then enjoy it. There is no right or wrong way to do things. So if you're happy with how it is right now, then that is wonderful. And if you're not happy, there are changes you can make in order to hopefully enjoy it more. And before we close, I'd like to thank therapynotes.com for sponsoring this video. Therapy Notes helps with scheduling, notes, and billing, and they have a HIPAA secure telehealth platform so they cover all of your practice management needs. If you'd like to check out Therapy Notes, you can get two months to try it for free with no commitment just by clicking the link in the description of this video. Well, I hope you found this video helpful no matter what your career path looks like right now. Let me know in the comments what sorts of values you like to prioritize and how you live out your career. And until next time, from one therapist to another, I wish you well.